Good evening and welcome to the Force to Freedom podcast on the Seeds of Liberty Network. You can find all our content at theseedsofliberty.com or on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, and Twitter. My name's Donnie. Lloyd is uh, moving this week from California to Texas, so he's busy. Um, The topic tonight is just bad arguments and where do they come from. And uh, how do people get such beliefs that are so obtuse and so strange that any real civil discourse can't happen with with certain people, certain groups, certain belief systems? They're they're just so far out there that uh, you know you can't even really function with them anymore. And it, a lot of that has come home here to America. Uh, you know, there used to be quite quite open open mind and open spirit here, and in my lifetime, that has gotten very hostile, very closed minded, very regimented, battle line kind of thing. You know, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal. Uh, never thinking, you know, those terms don't even really mean anything. So uh, we're going to get into three specific points tonight, for me anyway. Lloyd had some other stuff, but uh, he is smarter than me. So we're just going to keep it low ball and blue collar and work through just some fundamental stuff that just about everybody should have a look at themselves. This is not something you start off by pointing at your friends. This is this is for you to work on you. You to understand your own beliefs and why you do it because if you don't question those things, you if you've never questioned those things ever, any of them, chances are you are a borderline crazy person. Now, you might present well, but you might have some really outlandish things in your head that just work with uh, some very strange, funky logic. It's really just subjectivity put onto other people. And a a lot of people don't even know it. I I did it for a long, long time. I didn't even really start the process of pulling my head out of my ass until I was about 31, 32. So uh, I I don't cast any rocks at anybody. I just try to get people to understand I was a walking zombie for a while and you have to check your own self before you can check anyone else out yet you have to make sure that your own sanity and your own arguments are worthy of taking somebody else's time with it's, I mean that's just basic you know courtesy as far as I'm concerned so the the three points here are going to be hubris ignorance and fallacy and uh, we'll start with hubris I use uh, the Google definitions are close enough to, to get us in the we're into the right area because it's really not a semantics argument. The whole purpose of language is I have a concept in my head and I'm trying to lay the concept to you. And I keep saying to and you keep saying de because you're from France. We have the same idea. And as long as the concept that I'm giving you is coming across that that's clean, then, then we should be good. And uh, some people like to get into semantics arguments about over the definitions of words. And uh, I, there's a place for that, but I don't think, I mean, that's kind of more of an advanced level argument. It's really not not the basic waking up, uh, you know, pulling your head out of your ass kind of argument. So hubris is excessive pride or self-confidence. And if you are a former military guy, there is a good chance you're sporting some of this. It's kind of part of the culture. You know, we you know we run longer, we do more push-ups, we drink more. It, it kind of is the nature of, of that whole job. You kind of have to have a little spring in your step. If you're willing, you know, if your function in life is to take on other human beings and in, in a contest to the death, you have to have at least something about you, whether it be genuine or whether it be not genuine, that says, uh, I'm better than you in a life or death conflict. So... <clears throat> where do people get hubris in their beliefs and uh i'm gonna start you know i'm gonna i'm gonna throw the first stone i'm gonna say uh my country's better than yours america's the greatest place in the world well well really where do we get this from and and it's nothing but this pure hubris that somehow because your mom crapped you out on this piece of dirt that somehow you're better than the guy who got crapped out on a different piece of dirt somewhere else and if you look at it that way, it really is fundamentally ridiculous. I'm not saying that America isn't one of the better places to be born, but that's not that doesn't philosophically make superior human beings. All that does 
is it makes us fortunate. We are, we are lucky to be born here. We are lucky to have clean drinking water, electricity, uh, you know, meat, comforts that, that people don't have in other places. And it doesn't make this place better. It's not like this place is so much better managed than other places. In, 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 in efficiency sense, at least, uh, we have managed to sprout up an empire and we use that against people. Uh, it kills many of them. The Middle East is one of the greatest sufferers. Africa is a real economic uh, shithole because of a lot of our trade policies. South America, um, they can't really sell their sugar here because America has been subsidizing sugar since before I was born. Um, cotton, wool, there's a whole lot of subsidy that goes on. So. If you want to say, oh yeah, well we are the, the the most violent empire on the planet and we you know we rule because we're bigger than you, okay, that's not a very sound philosophical argument, and, but you but it is correct. It's pragmatically correct. We will kick somebody's ass if they try to uh, establish a gold standard or anything like that. But thinking that you're better than someone else just because of that, that's really, I mean. Take a good look at yourself. Are, are you willing to just kill somebody because you think that being an American is better than you? It, it's it's kind of ridiculous. But a lot of people have that hubris in their head. There are Christians who will say uh, the Jews are God's chosen people. Now, when the Jews say God, they're God's chosen people, that's hubris. When the Christians do it, it's still hubris because it's my God has a bigger dick than your God. And, uh, you know... They might be his chosen people, but I support them, so I'm kind of, uh, you know, I'm in the stands on the right side of the field. And that, in and of itself, caused a lot of problems in Gaza. Uh, it's ca caused the initial forming of the Israeli state, uh, how that, that whole acquisition of land went down. It, it had nothing to do with a real estate agent. They, they killed a lot of the Palestinians and just threw them out of their houses. And that's, you know claiming, oh, well, we're from this part of the world. Well, I'm part Indian and part German. So I don't think I get to go waving a gun and claim Hamburg, Germany, and all of the Susquehanna Valley because that's where my ancestors are from. It's kind, it's ridiculous. So hubris will just make you look like a four-star jackass if you're going to make those kinds of arguments, even if you're really articulate, even if you downplay it and kind of throw a lot of verbosity at it. It, it's just not any fundamentally sound way to come up with a belief system. All right, I consider that horse dead. So moving on to ignorance. Uh, there's a word that's kind of fallen out of usage in uh, the English language called nescience. And nescience is uh, basically this piece of information cannot be, is not known, cannot be known. So, well, not, not either or. I mean, this piece of information is not or cannot be known, and that's nescience. So, you know, we don't know if there's uh, life on other planets, if there are, where it is. We don't know that answer. So if someone is demanding that answer from you, it's unrealistic. You, there's no way you can know it. However, in an ignorance level, and this is where the vast majority of people was, was and still are, um, I was. And uh, they argue from what they think they know, but what they don't know. And all ignorance is lack of knowledge or awareness in general, uneducated or unsophisticated. And that is really telling about how America is these days, because one of the things that you know people fight in public discourse about a lot is public education. And the more, if you were to, to just use the definitions of education and indoctrination, and then you were to compare the process that goes on in the American school system, you would have to be heavily intellectually dishonest to not call it what it is, and that's indoctrination. You don't really come out a hell of a lot smarter on the other side. The, the idea, there, there was talk of, uh, you know, Obama should give everybody two, two free years of community college. I don't think there could be a greater measure of failure, admitting of failure, I'm sorry, admission of failure, that we just had your kid for 13 years, K through 12, and they are completely 
unable to move through life. They, they, they are not ready for jobs. They, they are somewhat worthless. We, we need to give them two, free, two more years of quote-unquote free education. And the, the people that it's churning out are hilarious. There's a guy, I, I want to say his name is Mark Dice, but he might be, I might be using that. I might be thinking of some, somebody else. He does these videos. He'll go walking on a boardwalk down in California with, uh, the, I think the last one, he was walking down with a 10 ounces of bar of silver and uh, a Hershey bar. And he would offer a Snickers. And he'd offer people, you know, would you like this candy bar or would you like this 10 ounce bar of silver? And, and people don't ha are so ignorant that they're like taking a candy bar. He was walking down the boardwalk the one day looking for sign uh, to, to sign a petition for a preemptive nuclear strike on Russia. And he's doing this, you know, the disinterested uh, sales pitch, you know, hey, can we get your signature for this and blah, and we're just going to do the preemptive nuclear strike on Russia. And people are signing it, left and right. Like two people questioned him. Now it was probably edited, and I would hope that he found, you know, that it was only one out of ten that signed that bullshit. But the, the amount of people that he found that will sign a petition to do a preemptive nuclear strike on Russia for whatever. I, it, it's it's alarming. It's alarming the level of ignorance that people have on a day-to-day -day basis in almost everything. And it, and I think a lot of it comes from they, they think they know, but they don't know. They've never taken the time to learn. Everything that was served up to them was accepted as fact, and then they moved on from it. They never they never decided to, to learn after they left school. Even the ones that went to college, they, they stopped learning they, they just believe now, and they move on through life. And this is really, really dangerous, especially when it comes to the next topic, logical fallacies. A fallacy is a mistaken belief, especially one based on unsound argument. Now, uh, you can logically validate false things, because uh, if, as long as you put it in the logical format, um, it is considered logical. However... Uh, sound is to be considered valid and true. So basically, you've placed this uh, tidbit of information in a logical format, and the statement at the end of that, you know, after it is is gone through this logical process, is true. To give you a quick example of valid, either Elizabeth owns a Honda or she owns a Saturn. Elizabeth does not own a Honda, therefore Elizabeth owns a Saturn. Now, that is logically valid. That is a logically valid statement as it is in the correct format and structure. However, if uh, Elizabeth doesn't own a Saturn, then it's, then it's an unsound argument because even though it's valid, it's going to be unsound. So you have to... It, there's a lot to there's a lot to logic. It's it's not just a, a simple thing where I'm uh, when people think logic a lot of times they're actually thinking of um, informal logic. They're thinking about making an argument as opposed to understanding uh, how to that you know the the form of logic. So you could say something that's false and do it logically. It's valid. It's not sound. I'm sorry. It's valid and unsound. So. The, the, I would think that, I mean, as long as you're a, an intellectually honest individual, the goal is to make a sound argument. And for an argument to be sound, it must be valid and true. And I think that's where the logical fallacy really steps all over people. Because especially, especially educated people, um, you know, the less people know, the more stubbornly they know it. But, but this is for the people who've actually... You know, did some education, did some, uh, you know, post-high school education. Uh, they get trapped into a lot of these things. Some of them are super popular. A bandwagon fallacy, you know, if every person on Earth says you know, the moon is not 300,000 miles, 260, whatever, whatever the distance to the moon is. If, if everybody on the Earth says it's not that, and you're the only one who does, that doesn't mean that you're wrong just because a lot of people think you're wrong. And the, the bandwagon is a real ball buster because this is the foundational premise of voting. We're all going to cast, a, cast our lots in this hat and 
whoever, uh, you know, whichever side has the, the most votes wins. And, uh, you know, what if we're voting? I mean, every gang rape is essentially just a small vote as to uh, whether or not this woman has exclusive use of her vagina or she has to share with the group. I mean, that's, that's literally all the vote is. And, and even if the question isn't moral... In, in in any sense, it still comes back to: is it just is it right to impose your will on a bunch of people just because you have them outnumbered? And and that's really the the ball buster of the of the bandwagon. And so many people fall into this. So many people think that just because a lot of people think the same way they do, that all of a sudden this is an airtight argument, and they can quit thinking and they can go about their day. It, and it's painful to watch. It's absolutely painful. Um, I'm going to pick a couple others here because there's a couple of ones that are really common. Appeal to authority is uh, essentially, well, it's the law. So, I, and it, I mean, just take a moment and think about all of the things, all the atrocities of human history have essentially come under, under the law. All the Jews were killed legally. Uh, every slave was owned legally. Uh, and we're told to get back to the, at the back of the bus or uh, get away from that particular water fountain. That was all legal. So, so to say just because it's the law doesn't mean you have any idea what you're talking about. None. None. But it's really hard to admit that. That's a big cultural thing in America. America's very, very authoritarian society. So it's all this top-down, you'll be told what, uh, you'll be told what your opinion is. And, uh, it's kind of how it works out. Um, there's another one. It's not used as often, but it is used by by the by the real knuckleheads. Um, appeal to force. You know, well, if I could kill you and take it, then you know, it must be okay. And no, no, that's not how that works either. And and you know, the the weird thing is a lot of people understand this in their own personal lives. They're decent people, but all of a sudden, when they start talking politics just about any any real excuse that they could use to justify their preconceived notions will fall out of their mouth and there will be a great deal of butt hurt if you shut any of this down it's it's kind of amazing how that how it works where people you know they have this belief and the minute you tell them no that can't be true geez they, they just lose their mind uh, appeal to consequences is pretty much a, a religious one. Uh, if you believe in God, you'll find a fulfillment in life that you never felt before. Therefore, God exists. You know, the appeal to good consequences. The appeal to bad consequences. If you don't believe in God, then you'll be miserable uh, thinking that life has no meaning. Therefore, God exists. And it, 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 when you're outside of that argument... It's pretty easy to see how ridiculous it is, and I, I think a lot of the, uh, I think the the rise in the atheist uh, circles in the last forty years or so, really has has taken some of this to to a good place where you know people have to defend their beliefs, especially the ones they have intention of imposing on other people, but a lot of those same atheists have have gone completely crazy because they think they're atheists, but they've essentially just traded their gods in. Now their god is the state, and they make all of these arguments for the state that they would never let a theist make in in the name of God. They'll they'll in a heartbeat they'll make it in the name of the state. So it is uh, it's pretty interesting to see somebody shift gears and how they're they're very much on top of their game when it's when it's their own feels. But as soon as it starts rubbing against their grain, then they immediately jump on this fallacy band uh, fallacy tool to to try and make it sound just make it appear that they know what they're talking about and uh you know it's not i, I kind of say this to discourage people like this isn't about winning an argument if somebody's bringing up a, a valid point like hey you know we probably shouldn't carpet bomb this entire strip of dirt somewhere because there's oil underneath it i don't think the goal should be well i have to win this argument uh, it seems, I mean, that that's part hubris, part ignorance, and just a whole lot of, man, what the fuck? Uh, I, I don't know, I, I just I just don't understand 
uh, some people anymore. I was never really much of a, I don't want to say I was a, I wasn't an anti-warmonger, but I wasn't a warmonger either. It was, you know, if we have to get into a fight, you know, at least let's go in with clear cut, you know, we're, we're going to go in with an objective to win. We're going to take as few casualties as possible, even if that has to be horribly violent. And I come to, I come to horrible levels of violence to, from a very logical place. The Gulf War, you know, slowly people were dying. And over the course of, you know, the so far I think we're up to about, you know, 6,000 people or something like that. And that's, I'm not trying to make that number sound light, but considering that the other team, uh, yeah, between Afghanistan and Iraq, I want to say they're looking at upwards of 3 million dead. You know, we're all the way up into 6,000. You know, no matter how you slice it, you can add up all the 9-11 victims. You can add up every person that a cop shot. You can add up all the murder victims and we're nothing. We're nothing the amount of Americans that even the American amount of Americans that died of natural causes in that period of time. The, well, maybe maybe that one. Maybe that starts to approach the amount of people that the Amer the federal government has killed during these two wars. But uh, if you if if four or five thousand people died in the first week, how long do you think that war would have happened? So when when the casualty levels are low, there's you know you. People seem to. Uh, I'm, I'm on a little bit of a tangent here, but when the casualty levels are low, uh, people seem to tolerate the war a little better. They they they're not screaming in the streets for it to end. Whereas when the casualty levels are high, people start freaking out and they really want it to stop. And uh, so the shorter and more violent, more bloody the war is, the quicker it's over. And those those casualties don't even have a chance to drag out. It doesn't become a natural part of the population where, you know, after 10 years, people are like, oh, yeah, is that war still on? Oh, yeah, well, we don't lose enough people that anybody's really affected by it. I mean, some people are, but percentage-wise, it's a really small percentage. So you go in with overwhelming violence, and you just get it done. And, and that, in the long term, that really stems those casualties. I mean, if you think, I mean, if you... you if you're if you're talking about your own people, if we carpet bombed all 26 million people of Iraq into the dirt in 2002, then we wouldn't have lost anybody else in Iraq. We wouldn't be discussing foreign policy decisions. Is that 26 million dead? Yes, I understand it. It's, but if the goal is to keep your body count low, it's it's just a horrible thing. War is a horrible thing, no matter how you slice it. So I'm of the I'm of the opinion, fast, ugly, get it done. And don't let it become the norm. Don't let it draw out. Because that eventually kills more people in the long run when it becomes the state of normal. Sorry for the tangent, but um, I know I have at least one or two more of these fallacies that people use a lot. Oh, good old ad hominem. We can't, we gotta skip it. Can't, can't skip ad hominem. It's, it's probably the most common one. Uh, and essentially it comes down to if you can't attack the person's position, you attack the person. Donald Trump is wrong because he doesn't know the difference between a barber and a taxidermist. Like, that's just a classic ad hominem attack. And that is how, I mean, Jesus, if you have a Facebook account and you've ever done anything but post pictures of cats, you have had somebody tell you that you're wrong and you're a fucking idiot. Oh, I'm sorry, that you're wrong because you're a fucking idiot. And uh, that doesn't... I mean, that, we all know that's ridiculous. That's not a point. It has nothing to do. If you can't assassinate somebody's argument, why are you even bothering to assassinate their character? That's kind of icing on the cake. But, you know, the way people, quote, think, unquote, these days, as long as you can be witty, you're a winner, right? And, and ugh, Jesus. Um, I think I'm going to pull one more out here one or two um the the good old appeal to antiquity uh it's always been that way you know oh, we've always had this system and uh well just because you know for thousands of years uh humans kept slaves uh there were just as many white slaves as there were black slaves now granted that wasn't during the very short period of american history because slavery had gone on for five or six thousand years before anybody found the Americas, so uh, slavery in America that was just a very short, brief period of time, and and that uh, you know, of course, the the majority of slaves here were black, 
some were indentured servants and some got their indentured servitude uh, extended and some of them were white. But beyond that, you know, the vast majority of slavery in America for that short period of time was purely black slaves. But for thousands of years, well, we've always kept slaves. I mean, we can't just go, you know, who will pick the cotton, you know? If we let all the slaves go, who will pick the cotton? These are the kind of arguments that come from the appeal to antiquity. It's it's just kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, yield appeal to authority. I don't think I mentioned that already, but, uh, you know. Uh, oh, well, the Constitution says so. Well, what if the Constitution is wrong? Well, the Constitution can't be wrong. It's the supreme law of the land. Uh, says what? The Constitution. So you start off with an appeal to authority because, it, you know, all the answers lie in the Constitution. And then you get into the circular logic where the Constitution is its own, you know, it's its own authority. And uh, I'm just going to give you the website because it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, logicalfallacies.info. www.logicalfallacies.info. It's, uh, it's really good to just go, if you read one a day, You'll be done in a month, and you know it'll only take you four or five minutes a day. Just go read, and uh, just to get a good idea of what you are talking about about you. Examine your own beliefs. Examine your own arguments. You are the only person you're really going to be able to fix. Everybody else, you could just kind of shine a spotlight on their ignorance, or their hubris, or their bad arguments. To, to show them that, hey, these beliefs, you know, they, they hurt people. They hurt other people. And, uh, yeah, I, I, that's, that's about it for me today. Uh, this is my first solo flight because uh, I'm used to, I'm, I'm a much better in a, in a live environment, but uh, my cohort is not around this week. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, there's Forced Freedom page on Facebook got any questions send them uh we will be happy to tackle them as soon as we get them first available convenience so thanks have a good week